Hi everyone, my name is Declan McGlynn. Welcome to Friday Forum Live, Point Blank's weekly broadcast bringing you exclusive tutorials, artist interviews and industry insight every Friday live from East London. Today we're joined by Max Wheeler from Anushka, who'll be performing live and explaining how their setup works using Ableton Live and Push. So Anushka are a Brighton-based duo who've been championed by the likes of Annie Mac and Mixmag and have just released their debut album on Giles Peterson's acclaimed imprint, Brownswood. As we're hosting a very special, very special, I should say, Ableton Live Open Day here at our London campus today, we thought it'd be a good idea to get Max to come in and show us how his live show works and get more of an insight into Anushka's music making process. And if you want to learn more about performing and producing in Ableton Live for yourself, you can find out more about our courses here at Point Blank at online.pointblanklondon.com. And remember, we are completely live and interactive, so get your questions in and we'll get to them at the end of the broadcast. So welcome, Max. Welcome to Friday Forum. Yeah, no, it's nice to be here. Thanks for having me. So let's just get straight into it. I mean, you use Push. Do you want to just talk us through your setup first and then maybe we can like have a look at your yeah, performance? Yeah, basically, I, um, for the live show, I use Ableton, Push, and I've got this little Korg Nano as well, which I use just for an extra little bit of control. Um, and it's been a bit of an evolution of how I've got here, but basically we've been traveling all over the world this year, and this little setup fits in a bag and I can carry it onto the plane with my carry-on luggage, get out, do the show, and you know, we have, we have kind of odd, odd weekends where we're doing two or three shows, sometimes even in a day. Mm. So having this setup where I can kind of quickly bash it out, perform the set, pack it up, get to the next place, do the next thing has been a bit of a lifesaver for me. Um, because yeah, I, was, I, was, I tried a few different iterations before I got to this one and this one just seems to be quite intuitive and quite kind yeah. of, it's quite reliable I think is the big thing. Sure. So, yeah. And you usually perform with a vocalist? Right? Yeah, well Anushka is a duo of myself and a singer Victoria Port who is a, she's a singer songwriter, I'm a producer and then we both kind of collaborate in the studio. Um, and the live show at the moment, well it has been just us two performing as a duo but we're starting to work with more backing vocalists. I think over the next year we probably will start to bring in more instrumentalists and stuff as well but at the moment yeah Ableton is kind of the core of the live show. Cool, so maybe do you want to give us a little bit of a preview yeah. as to well, what, what it sounds like? What I thought I'd do today because Victoria obviously isn't here with us um, I thought I'd put together something new, so I've kind of put together something a little bit exclusive, which is just, yes. yeah, it's a, it's a beat that I was just kind of throwing around in the studio um, this week that I made on the MPC. So I've put a few bits into Ableton, um, kind of playing around with a few VSTs and stuff in there, and I thought at the end I'll segue into some of the tracks from the Anushka set, just so you can sort of see how maybe I'd blend that in. So it's, a, it's pretty experimental, so bear with me. <laughs> but yeah, shall I, uh, shall I take it away? Yeah, whenever you're ready. Okay, so... Thank you. 
Nice one. There you go. Whew. Nice one, mate. Yeah, so, so I was just watching you. I mean, you start off and your line scripts, everything filtered, right? And yeah. then you like filter it up. Yeah, right. yeah. I think, I think the thing that I always kind of found is I started out doing everything with volume sliders, but I right. just, 
I think I just find filters a bit more musical. Yeah. So I tend, I tend to filter stuff in place of just automating volume or changing volumes, just because I think when I make stuff in the studio, I, I tend to do that. So if I do that in a live show as well, it kind of, mm. it seems to fit more with the music itself. And it's a bit yeah. more subtle as well when you're bringing it in. Than yeah. Like straight up just bringing it up in its initial volume. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, and um, I don't know, I mean, that, to be honest, is kind of atypical of what I do in our, our every, most of the time our live set, yeah, as I say, I'm working with Victoria. And I suppose one of the things I'll probably talk about today is I'm a big admirer of people like John Hopkins. And, you know, if you watch his live set, I love what he does with all the kind of chaos pads and glitching stuff out and breaking stuff mm -hmm. down. But what I found is when I early on maybe tried to do a bit more of that stuff, it tended not to support Victoria as a songwriter. It tended to draw more attention to the kind of production side of it. And so I've kind of refined what I do basically to, to support the song. And then there'll be parts. So what I was doing there was kind of maybe more like the little bits in the show where I do break it down a bit more or condensed into one section. So I kind of tend to have places in the show where I'll maybe go a bit more out there. But a lot of the time I found that the, you know, the best shows are the ones where I keep it quite focused and just don't add stuff that doesn't need to be there. And I think it's kind of just maturing as a producer, actually, that yeah. when, when I started producing, I'd be like, right, every track has to have every single thing in my studio on it. And I need to try and show everyone how clever I am and get as many ideas into it. And I found that that stuff wasn't getting signed by record labels. Yeah. And then I was talking earlier on to, um, to David from Ableton. It, I, I kind of like the idea of a restricted palette. So you say, right, for this track, I'm going to use these three really good sounds. And um, a, a mate of mine a long time ago said that producing is like making a sandwich. That it's basically how good your ingredients are defines how good the sandwich is. Not really how fancily you chop up the cucumber. And I, I kind of, I do, I do always go back to that and think, right, so that when I make the tracks, a lot of it is I'll have a couple of analog synths that I just know are sound great. Mm. I'll use the MPC a lot to do the drums because I just love what MPC patterns sound like with drums and sampling. And then maybe one VST or a couple of little bits and some filters and stuff. And that all, that'll end up kind of sounding like me. And I think when I've tried, yeah, to overproduce stuff, it ends up not being the best best stuff on the record normally yeah, sure. and so then in the live show when I try and throw a million things at it just to be performing it doesn't actually necessarily sound good in the crowd so I think sometimes with me it's just kind of trying to just yeah, find the balance yeah yeah exactly yeah so you usually use logic right to actually make music so you don't use Ableton to produce well I mean this is the thing I've down the years I've kind of I started out using uh, mod trackers back in the day my first actual record deal um, I made all the beats with a piece of Swiss shareware mod tracker <laughs> and um, which I think showed me it doesn't really matter what you're necessarily using it's how comfortable you are with it yeah, sure. but then I used Cubase for a while um, switched from Cubase to Logic and at the moment I'm because I'm using Ableton so much for the live show I'm starting to write in it as well and it's like I've just been on tour with Gorgon City and I was talking to them and they're a production duo one of them uses Ableton and one of them uses Logic right. and it's kind of like that's what my head's like at the moment <laughs> I'm kind of I've, I've started writing a lot more in it just because I'm on tour with the push I'm around it a lot and I'll kind of play with it. But it's funny, whatever, whatever DAW I use, I always seem to come back to the MPC. Right. That, so even when I'm using push, I'll still find that because me and the MPC go back a long way, I just love Old friends. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I, I think most producers have got that thing, haven't they, where yeah. everyone's like, why are you still using that? And it's just, it's just kind of, I don't know, it's whatever you enjoy. But I do find that, yeah, messing around with the push, it is a similar kind of thing where you can get quite lost in it. And I like stuff when I'm not really looking at the computer. Like I think during that little bit there, I only really touched the computer maybe once. Um, and MPC and push and all that. I, I love anything like analog stuff as well. Like I've got, um, I've got a Juno 6, which I got MIDI retrofitted. So I kind of quite often will write stuff on the computer, but then send it to the Juno and I'll just happily sit and tweak that without even looking at the computer. Yeah, sure. um, so how do you go about when you finish tracking Logic and it's produced and it's done? moving yeah. it to the live set is it by taking each bit in loops and well i mean this is this is the thing that for the anushka record it was actually mixed down as well by a mix engineer so a lot of the time part of the part of the set effectively i'm using kind of dj backing tracks sort of pa backing tracks because if you think and this is the thing i always end up talking about um if i think how many hours say like a track like yes guess the one i was playing at the end there making that beat and doing all the automation and the build-ups and the breakdowns and the drum programming and mixing it, you know, that's good, probably a couple of weeks work or something on that one track. So then to try and produce it live, 
using stems, it kind of just seems a bit crazy to me when it's like, well, I've, I spent a long time making it sound how I want. So I'm not gonna unnecessarily break it into pieces and perform it live when it's gonna actually sound worse. So unless, unless when I'm performing it live, it's gonna sound better, I'll, you know, I'll happily go with chunks of the original mix. And then, yeah, say sections like that where I'll break it down, I'll bring in a drum machine. And I, what I wanna do actually is, um, I've been experimenting a lot with the push and the Juno, sort of analog outboard stuff. I love how you can sequence stuff. So I think what I'll tend to do with the set is have parts of the track which are my studio mix down, but then parts where I'll break it down to stems and bring in analog stuff and drum machines when I wanna mess with it. So I don't, yeah, I don't really wanna have like 15, 20 stems open in yeah, Ableton yeah. just for the sake of triggering everything live. Mm. I, I, had a, I had a really good chat actually with Throwing Snow. Um, the, um, he's on Hound's Tooth and I, mm. I guess you guys probably already know him. But I was talking to him about um, his live show and how he did it. And he was kind of saying that really, unless the audience can see that you're doing something live, why are you doing it? If it doesn't sound better. So a lot of the time I'm, I'm kind of in the studio. But that would be your advice for someone who's like, don't just do it for the sake of it. Yeah, well, what's the point? I mean, yeah. If but then I guess the other argument is that if you're not doing something, you're just standing there. But, so. but, but this is the thing where if you are literally just standing there, well, then you're thinking, well, why am I not just a DJ? and you kind of get into that whole separate thing. So, mm. I mean, I think the thing for me is that I like being able to throw stuff in at the last minute, put it into the set and manipulate it, which is why Ableton really suits me. But there are parts of the set where, if I'm honest, basically I'm DJing with Ableton. And then there's parts of the set where I'm performing with Ableton, but I don't want to make the entire set into a live performance just for the sake of me feeling like I'm doing it live. When the, the most important thing is, number one, that Victoria feels really confident to sing the song as well as she can sing it. And number two, that the audience have a great time and it sounds good. So I'm always thinking that's number one, that's number two. And re oh, really, they're both number one, you know, they're both kind of the objective. And so how I feel about what I'm doing, I'll get to that afterwards. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I'd rather make sure that the people in the rave are enjoying it. And I think, I think when it comes to stuff like using analog gear, I think I like the idea of bringing that in because I can hear the difference. If I'm in the crowd, I can hear. When someone's using some analog stuff on stage, I do always think, yeah, that sounds great. Like I was at a demo the other day where someone had a Zox box and you can, you can hear the difference. Yeah, totally. So if it's something where I can noticeably hear, well, that sounds better to do that live, then I'm up for it. But when it comes to stems in a sequencer, I'm not so sure. Right. Because I'm not sure that those separate stems are gonna sound better than playing a, a, P, a PA track. Yeah, exactly. And so maybe the solution would be to use MIDI the media from the track exactly. and then trigger it live. Exactly. And which, then you can do the filters and do like yeah, which play is, around with them synth. That, well, that's exactly where I want to go. And I think until I got the push, I couldn't, that wasn't really an option for me because I play keys in the studio. But in the studio, I can try it a few times till I get it right and edit any notes. Yeah, that yeah, I, yeah. But with the push, it, what's quite nice is you can step sequence. So I think where I want to go is be building up step sequence stuff with analog gear and then, you know, dipping into arrangements of the songs. What has really changed as well, since we started working with backing vocalists, I can actually throw it around a lot more because we don't have to stick as religiously to the song structures that we were using. So I think I'm, I'm definitely going to get more experimental, but unless there's a specific reason for me to do it live and I can hear the difference, I'm not going to do it just for the sake, do you know what I mean? Just for the yeah. sake of feeling like oh, I'm doing this all live. Because, and the, the, the way that I learned that was doing it the other way. I had a project before Anushka it was, it was a nine piece band. So I had a full brass section, bass, guitars, drums, and I was basically on Ableton. And I, I did stem absolutely everything and I had everything as loops. And I was, so I had to, all the way through every song, I was kind of following it, triggering everything at the right time. And it was a lot of work for me. It gave a lot of issues to some of the mix engineers. And when I listened back to the recordings, I couldn't tell. There, would be, there was no way I could tell the difference between me doing it live and mm -hmm. having just played it all as a prearranged and it just it really made me think, like, well, what's the, what's the logic behind it? Yeah, you know? there is that. I mean, we'll move on to how you work with the vocalists in a second, but mm. I just wanted to make the point that there is that kind of time right now where there's DJ sets and there's live DJ sets and there's live sets. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, what is live anymore for electronic yeah. music? I mean, there are obviously acts out who are doing incredible things yeah. with live since live and with no backing tracks at all yeah. and things like that. So, well, well, this is the thing where say like, yeah, like I use the example of John Hopkins um, and yeah, there's a lot of people where I kind of watch their live sets and I'm really blown away, but I think it's slightly different when you're working with a vocalist. Right. And especially when you're working with a song, because say what I was doing there, I'd quite happily do that entirely live with loops and with, you know, VSTs and with analog stuff, because it's up to me what the arrangement is. 
and no one else is relying on my arrangement for their performance. But I think as soon as someone's relying on your performance yeah. to give them the arrangement that they sing the lyrics to, it just changes the kind of the dynamic a bit. So I think probably, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not knocking at all people who do perform with Ableton in that way because I think it's really creative. But I think when you're working with a band or a vocalist, you just need to really think about, well, what sounds good? What's making everyone else give their best performance? And, you know, what's the audible difference between doing it this way and that way? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I'd, all, all it is, is I'd say is, you know, let yourself do whatever's the most fun. So live, the thing I love doing with the push is um, using the drum machine and sequencing the drums live. So that's the, quite often I'll, I'll have a backing track with no drums. So I'll just do the drums live. And that's something I really enjoy because it's quite visible to the crowd what I'm doing. Yeah. They can see what I'm doing and they can kind of vibe off of it. I can drop little fills and things in, but I'm not having to memorize the entire structure of the song. Do you know what I mean? And, yeah. and then if, I, if the chorus drops four bars too early, because I've been trying to switch from one setting to another and then, do you know what I mean? You've, you just, the bottom line is, however much fun you have on stage is how much fun they have in the audience. So make whatever you're doing as fun as you can. And that's just advice for having a record deal in general, you know, yeah, sure. maximize, maximize fun wherever you can. And in the studio as well, yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. If, it's, if, if it's you're not, not enjoying it, then. Then who is enjoying yeah. it? It's kind of, I, I really stand by that. I think if the process of making a record's fun, then listening to the record's generally fun as well. Yeah. So, so what advice would you give to someone who's working with a vocalist then with in Ableton? I mean, because you obviously you just you yeah. can get you can get as traditional or as experimental as you like in Ableton really with yeah. you can run the vocals through it, sample them, loop them, affect them, yeah. pitch them. Well, in my experience, having kind of tried it a few different ways, originally boiling hot in Hackney today. Um, yes, it is. In my experience, when we started out, I originally did run the vocals through Ableton and have right. lots of effects and stuff yeah. like that. But what I found was that's okay if you're working in a big venue with really good sound engineers and monitoring, because a lot of what we're doing is kind of one in the morning in a big rave, where they're not necessarily geared up to vocal acts. I found that doing it that way didn't always work. And it's generally I've found best to give a signal to whoever's doing the sound for the vocal and kind of let them balance that with Ableton especially if it is just kind of one output and a vocal. Mm. If you let them mix that, generally from their perspective, they've probably got a better ear on how it sounds than you have. But um, I think what, I mean, what we do quite a lot is I've got a lot of samples of Victoria that I will then kind of manipulate that are already part of the set. So I'll kind of have things prearranged like that. Um, cool, so is there, is there any like filters or delays or reverb effects that you're using to control with the core you'd recommend? Like I know I saw the Poly 6 from Korg there. Yeah, the, the Poly 6 is, I've kind of used that. It's funny, I had the Korg plugins for ages, but then that one I just recently went back to because I was just doing a bit of research into kind of early house music. And um, it just yeah, kind of. And the Poly 6. Yeah, yeah, and it just kind of kept cropping up again and again. And it's funny, I got it because that kind of pad sound that I opened with there is the sound I was looking for. But then what was funny, as soon as I started to play with that plugin, I thought, there's that bass sound I've been wanting as well. And there's. So I, 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 at the moment, that's a favourite of mine, but. Yeah. Um, Okay, there's all kinds of bits and pieces. The one actually that I'm really obsessed with at the moment is um, Satin, the UHE there's plugin. In the yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I love all things tape related. And I actually, in my studio, I've got a reel to reel. In fact, it's on the front cover of our, al uh, our album. You can see there's me and Victoria, and there's a, a reel to reel yeah, tape yeah. in the middle. I actually use that quite a lot just to record stuff onto and then just back in. So, say, like a typical process would be find some sounds, sequence them on the MPC maybe run them through some pedals or whatever, record them onto the tape and then back in and then chop it up again. So I'm, I'm a bit of a junkie with that kind of messing around with sounds. Um, but that Satin plugin is one of the ones I found where actually it does sound really good. Yeah. That, you know, I haven't, especially with remixes and stuff, sometimes there's a really tight deadline and I kind of think, well, I'd love to get the reel to reel out and do all this, but they want a mix by, you know, yesterday. yesterday. <laughs> so um, the, the Satin plugin I've used quite a bit on the album just quite nice to it sort of distorts stuff but in a nice harmonic kind of way um that's one of my favorite little bits at the moment i use all the uad stuff a lot well yeah a bit of a bit of a junkie for that as well and um i don't know i think i mean the, the big things i kind of a while ago i just went i went in pretty seriously on the studio and i got focals and the focal sub and a apollo and as soon as i had that it was right. like a complete life upgrade yeah um and i think that it, I think having that kind of the clarity when you're mixing stuff, because I think a lot of people... Is the CMSs or are they yeah, the twin six? Yeah, the CMS right. 65s and the, and the sub. And I think what I found is as soon as I had a sub in the studio, 
and I had some really good quality monitors and a sound card, suddenly I could hear all the mistakes that I'd been making with bits yeah. and pieces. The interfaces are so important, people don't realise how yeah. important the converters and, are. Well, the thing is, I think it's also, it's one of the last bits that you're willing to spend money on because it's usually the last bit you notice is not really working because it's quite, it's quite easy to kind of blame it on other yeah. bits and pieces. Yeah, totally. But then really everything you hear is coming through those two things. So it was a, it was a big investment, but then I found since then the stuff I've been doing has been getting signed and has been kind of sounding great. So I think that's part of it. But to be honest, the, the big kind of turning point, I think, is we started putting on a party in Brighton where we just got loads of producers together and got everyone to come and listen to their rough mixes on a decent sound system. Um, and what I found was having that community of producers, everyone kind of A-Bing their stuff against each other, checking it on a real sound system, going back to the studio, a being it. I found that meant that whole kind of crew of producers that I was working with, suddenly the levels went up. And I think, yeah, it's great to spend some money on some kit and everyone knows there's bits of kit that will change your life. But the big thing is having a community of producers that you're a part of and actually talking to each other and swapping ideas. I found that, and also funnily actually, probably just having a sub, having any kind of sub. If you're making this type of music, if you're making music which is bass heavy, then it might not make you popular with the neighbors. <laughs> but really in a way, it's a bit like if you're a pianist and you just lost the bottom third of the piano, you know, you can play, you can still write some songs like that, but then every now and again you're going to sit down at a grand piano and be like, what are all those keys? Maybe I should use some of those keys. And, yeah, yeah, and sure. you know, I just don't, I don't think you can really, unless you're either A, B in on a system with a sub, but you're playing out a lot to the point where you can, but I think even, you know, I'm playing out quite a lot now, I'm still not going to check my mixes at peak time because you're kind of, you don't want to mess things, you want, if you've got a, a, a vibe going, you don't want to check your mixes in the middle of that set. So. Mm. I think, yeah, having somewhere where you can listen to stuff. Um, but then also, it's funny, it's like these headphones, had these for ages, um, absolutely knackered. I don't know if you can see on the camera how worn out these are, but I know them really well. So there was a big period during our album when I had loads of madness going on in my life. I moved studio about three times during the album. So big chunks of it I made on those headphones at the kitchen table. Yeah, and I guess if you trust them, then. It's the thing, and yeah, yeah A, B it, show, show some mixes to some people you trust, get some feedback. And that's it, it's just getting a bit of a community around you. And I suppose, yeah, if, if you're starting to get to the point where it's work and work's coming in, then yeah, it's worth upgrading stuff then, I yeah, suppose. Totally. But cool. So yeah, we are um, out of time, unfortunately, but uh, nice to yeah. that performance was awesome. And uh, yeah. you're gonna stick around for the op Ableton Open Day later and yeah. show some people who are coming here how push works and stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm looking forward to that, actually. It'd be cool. fun to have a, have a little jam. Yeah, nice one. So. If you want to know more about using Ableton and performing uh, and producing, you can find out more about our courses at online.pointblanklondon.com. And if you're joining us for the Ableton Open Day later, we'll see you then. If not, we'll be back for another Friday Forum next Friday at 1 p.m. Cheers. Thank you.